Hey, welcome back to the EKG Show. Let's get into it. Today for you, I have three EKGs. Let's see if you get them all right. I'm gonna show you the EKG and then I'm gonna explain them to you. Here we go. So here's our first EKG of the day. Here we go. Now watch what's gonna happen here. The simulator loves to do this. So I'm gonna wait till the EKG kind of settles in. You'll see in a second. I like to play a little game. Then it's gonna come back, watch. Now wh what's going on here? Think you got it? This actually gives you a little bit of extra time. You'll see it come together, watch. Here it is. Okay, what do we got? Supraventricular tachycardia. See it right there? That's what I wanna show you. Right there, a consistent supraventricular tachycardia, SVT. Now with SVT, let's break it down. Supra means above the ventricles. So this impulse started above the ventricles. That is why the QRS complex is still narrow. Remember, ventricular rhythms are wide in origin. If it's super ventricular like this, it, look, at, look at the rate, it's super fast. Okay, usually SVT is above 170, 180, 190, 200, or even higher, right? That's SVT. Now, with SVT, what do we do? Well, it depends if we're stable or unstable. How do we determine stable versus unstable in EMS? Well, that is determined on three main things. Your patient's complaint, their mental status, and their blood pressure, okay? So, a stable patient would be someone who, maybe they have a complaint, that's fine, they normally have a complaint when they're having this rhythm, but they're still awake and alert, and their blood pressure is over 90 systolic, and their MAP is above 60. Unstable would be a patient who is either unresponsive or altered mental status. Yes, they have a complaint, but maybe a more serious one, like chest pain, they could be breathing, right? But on the blood pressure land, they're under 90 systolic. They're under a MAP of 60. They're deemed hemodynamically unstable. So stable patients get medications. Unstable patients, what do they get? Energy. They get shocked. They get cardioversion. And the big proto remember between cardioversion and defibrillation, cardioversion means you got a pulse, but you're unstable. And that's what SVT is, okay? So SVT always has a pulse. Now, stable, well, what do we do? Well, first, we can try something called a vagal maneuver. We can have the patient bear down like they're having a bowel movement. Surprisingly, that vagal maneuver, using the power of the vagus nerve, can actually lower the heart rate. It's amazing. I've used it numerous times throughout my career. And I'll never forget the first time I used it, and I was like, it worked. I didn't have to do an IV, I didn't have to do anything. It worked. So it was, like, it was amazing. So vagal maneuvers do indeed work. So that's step one. Step two. Step two is medications, which is most likely where you're gonna end up with an SVT, even out in the field, because vagal maneuvers don't always work, okay? We have adenosine is our main drug. So adenosine, we're gonna give that IV. Our goal is to get up in the AC, okay? Large bore IV. And with adenosine, it is six milligrams followed, if we, do, if we need a second dose, by 12 milligrams. Now, what other meds are in our second line if adenosine doesn't work? Calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. Exactly. For example, like low pressor, like Cardizem. Right. Beautiful. They're in our second line. Adenosine's our first line for SVT. Beautiful. Now, what about if this SVT is an unstable patient. Well, what do we do? In this case, we skip the meds, we skip the vagals, we don't got time for an IV, we don't got time for that. Energy selection. Now, let me show you how we do that. Here's, how we, here's what we gotta do. I'm gonna put the simulator down for a moment. Okay, we're in SVT, rates 217. We gotta take action. They're unstable, either unresponsive, altered mental status, right? 
They're complaining, chest pain, difficulty breathing, palpitations, bad complaints. What do we, blood pressure is low. Here's what we do. Well, first, I gotta do a synchronized shock. So I hit my sync button. When I hit my sync button, these little triangles go on top of the QRS complex. Notice them. Now I know I'm in sync mode on the bottom as well. Now what do I do? Energy selection. So let's just say I'm going to provide energy uh, here. Let's just say we're going to go with 50 joules, for example. 50 to 100 is our range for SVT. Let's say we're going to go with, start with 50 for this patient, right? Here's what we do. There's our, our 50 is in, locked in, in the corner. Now I'm going to hit charge. Of course, the pads are also on the patient. Ready? Okay, three, two, one, everybody clear. Going to feel a little jolt? Shocking. So now we've go ahead and shock that patient. It's going to print off when we deliver that energy. And then we're looking for some sort of change to occur with our patient, right? Now, if it doesn't look, we're right back where we were, right? But what can also happen is it converts the rhythm, which I'll show you here. And now let's say we're back at normal sinus. Pretty cool. Well, let's move on to another EKG, shall we? Let me know if you got this EKG down. Let's check it out together. All right, here we go. What do you think? Sinus bradycardia, sinus bradycardia. Now, what does sinus bradycardia mean? Well, the first thing I wanna share with you is sinus bradycardia, this could just be a normal finding in your patient. I'm probably in sinus bradycardia right now, right? Why? So here's the deal, folks. If you are someone who is active, if you are someone who is an athlete, more than likely, if you're in good cardiovascular fitness, your heart rate is gonna be below 60, probably somewhere you're in the high 40s or most likely the 50s. Some of the most amazing athletes in the world like that are endurance athletes, they can even have their heart rate be in the mid 40s, not even the low 40s. Now, 4T, like right here, will be really, really low, but it's possible, okay? Now, what, what does this mean when we see sinus bradycardia in our patient in the ambulance? Well, first off, they call the ambulance. So they probably have a complaint to investigate, right? Same thing we do with all AKGs, we split it up into stable versus unstable, right? So in stable land, there's two parts. Well, my first question here I'm gonna talk to you about is, is this patient complaining of anything? If they're not complaining of anything, but that you notice this, you wanna ask them, hey, has the doctor ever said your heart rate's just a little low, right? They might say yes, no, whatever. Would I follow up with an EKG, a 12 week EKG, which is right over here? I probably would because they called the ambulance for some reason, right? They gotta be playing them something, right? Maybe they're tired or weak. I'd follow up with a 12 week EKG, but they're not saying chest pain, they're really breathing and so forth. Continue to monitor your patient. You can consider doing an IV in the patient, but I would at least follow up with a full EKG. That's pretty fair, right? Now let's say uh, they have a real complaint that sounds cardiac in origin, like chest pain, difficulty breathing, uh, they passed out, um, they, they feel like they're gonna pass out, right? Then we say stable and stable. So how do we determine stable versus unstable? Again, the complaint, how bad is it? The mental status, are they awake and alert? Or are they unresponsive or confused? And then the other side is our blood pressure. Is the systolic blood pressure below 90, above 90? Is a mean arterial pressure above 60 or below 60? Stable, unstable, right? So in the stable land, what would we do? We would still do a 12 week EKG, but if we really thought this heart rate was causing all their problems and symptoms, I think a 12 week comes out totally fine. Then we can consider giving a medication like atropine, right? That would be our goal there. We can give a drug atropine for stable symptomatic bradycardias, right? Like sinus bradycardia, pretty cool, okay. Now, on the other side of the coin, what if this patient was unstable? They're critically unstable. You find nothing else wrong with them, but their heart rate is so low and they're in sinus bradycardia. 
you could go ahead and pace that patient using the pacemaker function on the life pack. So let me show you an example of how we actually do that. Now remember, other heart rhythms like second degree heart block, third degree heart block, right? A, it's too slow and they're unstable and you believe that the EKG is the primary problem going on, you can pace the patient, right? So here's how we do it. First, we hit the pacer button, okay? Now the pacer button's gonna say, hey, give me a rate to set. Let's just say for sake of argument, I'm gonna go to 75. I'm gonna hit the button here, okay? Now, see the little triangles are on top of that QRS? We're getting ready to get the pacing going. Now we're gonna actually provide the electrical current to pace the patient and have the pacemaker of this monitor take over the patient's heart. The pads are on the patient, by the way, if I didn't mention that, okay, before all this. Now, I'm gonna move this up ever so slowly until the current matches my EKG. I'm gonna bring it to 75 just to show you. Now look what happens. Now we have here, see that, that, that straight spike? That's the pacer spike in action. We can see now, remember the pace rhythm, any pace rhythm is gonna be wide, pure rest. Now we are good. So now if I click this, we're pacing with the, our pacer of the life pack. Great, we got one more step. This is called electrical capture. I can see the pacemaking function on the life pack. Mechanical capture, I gotta get a pulse. I gotta get a pulse of my patient. And I wanna make sure that pulse matches what I'm seeing here on the EKG. And that's what you do with an unstable bradycardia. By clicking in the first link in the description, you get lifetime access to my video vault program. The video vault includes over 480 videos of content and now holds over 2,000 national registry practice test questions. Also includes some really awesome bonuses like worksheets, drug cards that are pre-filled out all for you, community group access to ask me questions, and audio files when you are on the go. The video vault will find you no matter where you're at whether you're an EMR, EMT, advanced EMT, or paramedic student, and my students use this, whether you are getting ready for school, in school right now, or getting ready to go pass your national registry exams. So click the first link in the description right now and get yourself lifetime access to the Video Vault today. I'll see you there.